I'm not used to speaking to such an audience. I'm used to speaking to an audience that knows a lot less about technology than me. That is <laughs> bankers and investors. And you know, when I used to run a sales organization, uh, I used to tell the, tell the sales guys that um, it doesn't matter if you know very much. It only matters if you know more than the person you're trying to sell it to. <laughs> so um, I am a... I am really uh, at a deficit here. Um, the last time I wrote code, I don't know, 20 years ago maybe? It's been a, it's been a long time. So I'm not gonna focus on, um, on uh, technology uh, so much. And I'm gonna talk more about kind of the, the social impact of the university and what the university I think really uh, helps provide uh, to society. It's something I don't think we really talk about a whole lot. Now, um, at, at, as Mario said, uh, I graduated in uh, 1980. Uh, I was really, I'd say, an average student, although I gotta say my classmates thought I was very smart, so I, I guess I should have gone into sales instead of tech. Um, I've had a, uh, ups and downs in my career, and I've had a lot uh, of good luck in my career, and I don't think anyone who's successful should ever underestimate or, or, or downplay the impact of luck. You know, as Abraham Lincoln once said, I'd rather have a, good, a lucky general than a good general. Um, so, so luck is, uh, is really important. You know, when I graduated in, in 1980, I really had um, no idea that one day I'd be standing here. In fact, uh, honestly, in 1980, I couldn't even speak in public. I had a huge stutter. I was, you know, the typical geek. Couldn't even answer the telephone. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it, it's been hard through my career to kind of train myself out of that. And I never imagined I'd have kind of the success in the global life that I've had. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a kid from, uh, from Orange County. Um, I started work out here. I lived in Washington, D.C. I've lived in Singapore. Uh, I've, lived in, uh, I've lived in Europe, traveled all over the world. And uh, it's been fascinating and exposes you to so much more than what you get just, uh, just uh, insular here. But when I went to university, I saw it as a path to a job, you know, a path to a better life than my parents had. That's all it was. Uh, I didn't think I had the talent to, uh, to pursue uh, a doctorate. Uh, I didn't see that a master's would really help me on the job situation. Uh, so yeah, I was one of those um, uh, you know, terminal bachelors, which is what, probably 90, 95% uh, of students. Uh, that's what it is. Now, I was a bit better than Bill Gates, who did drop out of college. <laughs> so, um, but nothing like most of you. Um, and, but when I went to school, you know, I, I saw it as just that. that you know, this is the path to, uh, to a good job. Uh, and I never looked at university as anything more than, you know, than educating me, helping me with that. And you never had that kind of deeper thinking about what role the university really plays uh, in society. And I don't mean just for education, but really universities are at the core of social change. Uh, it provides that path for upward mobility, for people to do better than what their ancestors did. Diversity. It starts mixing the populations, not just racially, but you know, uh, you know gender, uh, social, economic status, etc. And it's really the path to social change and justice, you know, throughout the world. But before we get into all that, it's kind of review 1968. I'm, I'm a bit of a uh, a bit of a history buff. Uh, how many people were living in the U.S. in 1968, or were old enough to remember 1968? Okay, good. <laughs> That was a tough year. It was really one of, I think, one of the worst years, you know, other than maybe the Civil War years, in the country's history. And strangely enough, many aspects about it are quite similar to 2018, and uh, that is scary. The nation was very divided politically, <clears throat> except that Southern Democrats played the role that today's right wing uh, plays. Um, the country was still in the thick of the uh, racial and anti-war strife and turbulence. Martin Luther King and Robert F. Kennedy were both assassinated in 1968. We had forced busing causing a lot of issues in Boston, et cetera, because you know, uh, the government saw that equal access to education was really important in order to, uh, in order to achieve uh, you know, uh, parity and, uh, and harmony. 
And we had Tommy Smith and John Carlos at the Olympics with the black power salute on the medal stand, just as we get, you know, you know Kaepernick's and other football players kneeling protests these days. You know, so not much has changed in the last 50 years. And strangely enough, 1968 was also a groundbreaking episode of Star Trek. <laughs> the first ever interracial kiss on TV. It took until 1968 uh, for that to happen. And we were mired in what was, until very recently, the nation's longest war, the war in Vietnam. We had the Tet Offensive, which really kind of convinced the public that, the, um, uh, that there wasn't a good ending for the Vietnam War. Uh, and we're currently mired in what's now the nation's longest war, the war in Afghanistan, Iraq, et cetera. And I think we all realize, you know, one way or another, there is no good ending to that war. Uh, and the question is, you know, how do you end it? And of course, universities were the real driving force for social change. And we also had the first glimmers of the technology that we have now. And you know, some of this is exciting, but we didn't know it at the time. You know, mainframes were still the king, of course, although they were, frankly, fairly new. There was a group, of course, it was led by IBM, but there was a group called Bunch. Does anyone still know what Bunch stands for? Okay, good, we got a few. The rest of you can look it up on Google. <laughs> <laughs> they ruled. Data General, though, had its second, you know, had its second generation of mini computers uh, out there, so there was a glimmer of the future of what it was going to be. And strangely enough, and it was Samsung who pulled this up in their lawsuit uh, a couple years ago, a few years ago with Apple, the tablet computer first made its appearance in the movie 2001. I mean, we usually know that for how, but they have two tablets there also. Um, and then, of course, uh, we had um, you know, the moon in 69, but the Apollo navigation computer first came out in 1968. Of course, the other big thing in 1968, there were two of them, was the computer mouse. You know, that was 1968. In fact, the inventor of it uh, just died a couple years ago in, uh, in Menlo Park, Palo Alto. Um, and then ARPANET, the forerunner of the internet, 1968. So, uh, and then lastly, it seems ancient technology now, but brand new in 1968 was the floppy drive. Yeah, coming from Microsoft. I'm not, not Microsoft, IBM. <laughs> and you know, at that time, if all, we had this ARPANET thing, we had the mouse, you know, we had con some concept of goods. We had no idea about what were all the economic and social changes that this stuff would, uh, would end up bringing. You know, we just saw this technology, little toys, etc. But it was into that turbulent era that the ICS department came here at UCI. And you know, I'd like to address you know, how universities, as I said, really enable this upward mobility and social change. And I'm going to use me as a little bit of an example. Um, I was a geek back there, as I said. I had a pocket protector. I had a slide rule. Did anyone use a slide rule in here other than me? OK, cool, cool. Even in university, I still use a slide rule. Roots were so much simpler in a slide rule than trying to do it on a calculator of that era. Um, last night, I think I was the only one at dinner in blue jeans, um, which is what you wear in tech. I was just about the only one. Were you in blue jeans? Good. I'm proud of it. But I, I got ashamed last night. So today, I wore a suit for you, and I find most everyone is in blue jeans. <laughs> That's the true sign of a geek. You can't dress appropriately. Mm. I went to an investor conference about eight years ago with our big investor in Boston to address all of their, um, all of their um, investment partners. There's probably like 200 in the room. They're all in suits and ties. I'm in blue jean and an open shirt, but what can I say? Um, so it, it took me decades to stop being embarrassed about being a geek. But now, as we all know, geeks kind of rule. You know, geeks, geeks are the future. Um, as I said, I'm from Orange County. I grew up in Garden Grove, or as we affectionately called it, Garbage Grove. Anyone from oh, Garden yeah. Grove here? Oh, yeah. Are you Gar Are you from no, Garden Grove? Okay. <laughs> Keep them there. 
As I used to say, I had the best in-laws around. They live 10,000 miles away and speak no English. <laughs> so, um, but seriously, I was the first generation in my family, maybe in the extended family, uh, to go to college. I was one year behind my sister. I was from a blue-collar family. This was a time in Orange County when you can actually live on a blue-collar salary. I mean, that's uh, basically impossible these days. Both my parents, strangely enough, were children of hard rock miners. They were miners in Colorado. My dad's hometown is the highest town in the country, 11,000 feet. Um, uh, but as a child, he was two, one of two in the town inflicted with polio, uh, he and his sister. Um, he spent two years in the hospital, survived, had a paralyzed left leg. And when he retired and moved back to this town, uh, Leadville it's called, uh, he, uh, he remarked to me once that, in hindsight, having polio was the best thing that ever happened to him. Uh, because when he moved back there, he found out all of his childhood friends were dead because the lifespan of minors were so short. So um, he met my mother, of course. Uh, took them a year to convince her parents that a cripple was OK as a husband. Uh, obviously, he couldn't work in the mines, so they packed up their car and they drove to LA, uh, just on a promise. Um, you know, they had to, he had to make a living. He came here with nothing. Uh, the state at the time was offering vocational training, something I think the state no longer does, which is probably, uh, I guess we can blame it on Proposition 13, like everything else. Um, came here, uh, no job, got some state training to become a machinist, and uh, got a job in the aircraft plants. You know, my mother start, you know, started to raise five kids. Um, my parents were practicing Catholics. After five, they decided they didn't need any more practice. I'm <laughs> sure there's some Catholic families here who understand that. <laughs> um, uh, but my father was always fascinated by building things, and he hoped that I, you know, as his son, would become an engineer, uh, probably because you know, uh, then I'd be like the ones that he saw in suits that gave him designs of things to build as a machinist. But during school, I had no clue uh, that I could go to college. Uh, you know, when, uh, when you're coming from a family whose father was a high school dropout, he didn't finish high school, he, he couldn't, he was two years behind everyone. Um, and uh, yeah, I remember, in, I think it was actually 1968 when we were asked in, I don't know, fourth grade, fifth grade, to draw a picture of what you want to be, what you grew up. I drew a soldier because that's what my uncle was. He was uh, in the Air Force in Vietnam. And um, you know, he was more of a big brother. My parents raised him. Um, but I was a good student, especially in math and science. Everything came easy, even though I was lazy. I'm sure that resonates with a lot of people. Um, I was surprised when I came to Irvine and couldn't be as lazy. Uh, I think it was eventually uh, in high school as a freshman, I finally met with a guidance counselor. They didn't really have much of those in those days. Um, and, and said, hey, I'll probably go to community college. And it was a guidance counselor who's, who pointed out that, hey, you, know, you could get into a, a university. Um, I was fascinated with computers. I wanted a computer. I didn't really understand you couldn't actually you know, go to Radio Shack and get a computer in those days. But I started taking programming classes at Golden West, or as we called it, Golden Waste College. Any alumni of Golden West? OK. No? OK. Uh, so I did that as a high school junior and high school senior. And then there was some open house here at UC Irvine uh, in my junior year. I came here, decided, hey, it's a cool, it seems to be a good place. It was the only school I applied to for college. Thankfully, they accepted me. Uh, and I was accepted into ICS. Um, I didn't like it. I spent a year in it. I uh, didn't really enjoy it. So I switched over to math in my sophomore year. Um, Finished that in two years, but realized I had reached my Peter Principal limit with mathematics. Um, and um, had nothing to do in that senior year. So I switched back to ICS and um, finished that degree. Uh, and at the same time, I took a lot of art history. Art history was uh, the thing that I kind of really liked. Um, and in that era, uh, you, you didn't take loans. I mean, we worked. Um, I you know, worked a jack-in-the-box flipping, flipping hamburgers, and then I convinced a company called Delmar Avionics that I could actually repair cardiac equipment, uh, electronic repairs. Um, you know, and you, you do everything self-taught. But you could do all this. You know, tuition here was $300 a, a, a quarter, $900 a year, you know, plus books. Um, 
obviously, with uh, you know, all the funding cutbacks of the universities, it's not like that anymore. But it really helped my family. All five kids went to university. My sister went here, I went here to Irvine. She took a chemistry degree and then a doctorate. Uh, my um, uh, brother and uh, another sister went to Cal State Long Beach. My mother actually finished her, uh, her degree at Cal State Long Beach in 1981 um, after two of her kids. And then another sister went to, uh, went to Cal State Fullerton. So, you know, the, the state uh, college system here in California was just so helpful for all of that. So I finished my degrees here. My father could not really understand the value of a math or a computer science degree. What are you going to ever do in math? And even in the math department, all they could come up with was, oh, you could be an actuary. You, know, you either went to a PhD or you figured out, you know, what age people were going to die. Uh, neither were very exciting for me. Um, and, you know, my father wanted me to be, to, to, to be that engineer, so he was quite shocked when I actually got job offers for doing programming and kind of the salary they paid, which was what, you know, more than he was making as a machinist. Um, but, yeah, but he never really understood, you know, what could, could, what could you do with computers? What are they really going to do? So I started in L.A. with a really exciting and uplifting thing. I uh, uh, was uh, making sure that uh, nuclear weapons couldn't accidentally blow up because of the software. <laughs> I spent years doing, uh, doing uh, missile work. Some of it real, you know, uh, real intriguing, you know, flight control systems, launch control systems. In those areas, you didn't have GPS. You had stellar navigation, and of course, your math blows up when you fly over the pole. Um, you know, so a lot of real, uh, real challenging things. But frankly, that field is kind of depressing. I spent many years in it. I moved to Washington, D.C., but I was burned out on it. And uh, Semantic came knocking on my door to start up their government business. So I said, great, I want to get out of the military. Uh, type work. Uh, it's still military work, but it's in a commercial company. Maybe I can put some time in there and move uh, to the commercial side. And it worked. I was real lucky. Uh, we did a great job building up the, um, uh, the government business. Uh, I told them I was tired of it. And uh, they said, oh, how about you move to Asia and take over Asia for us? You know, just kind of out of the blue. So uh, we packed up. We moved to Asia. Um, uh, moved to Singapore, actually, which for people who have been to Singapore, it's nicknamed Asia Light. Um, yep. Uh, but it was a wonderful experience getting exposed to everything in that part of the world. China, India, Hong Kong, Japan, Indonesia, Malaysia, Korea. It was a perfect job and it came with an extra perk that didn't cost my company anything, which is I met my wife in Singapore. Uh, but every, you know, all good things come to an end, good luck runs out. I got posted back to the States to be the number two running the consumer business, called Norton. It's a great challenge, you know, you're running a $2 billion a year business, but I'm not a political guy, and big companies, a lot of politics, and I eventually decided to leave. And uh, luck struck well, again. Uh, my boss, who had moved me to, uh, to Asia, uh, was retired, and uh, this little company in Prague called Avast was trying to hire him. He didn't want to go back to work, so he put them in touch with me. You know, this was a very small company in Prague. It had a really interesting background. Actually started as a cooperative under communism in 1988 under the Russian occupation. Uh, I met with them. It was a company of geeks. There were 50 or 60 people. The entire marketing and sales team was one person. <laughs> the entire finance team was one person. The other, you know, 48 or 58, were all engineers. So it was, it was a great company. I took a massive pay cut to go there, but got some good equity, as we all hope. And I moved from running a $2 billion a year business to running a $20 million a year business. Um, but I thought it was something you know, that we could really turn into something good. So you know, the family packed up. We moved to, from Singapore to Prague. And you know, the company, we had a great product. We were loved by our users. We had a company full of geeks, as I said. And, uh, and we did. We succeeded. In the last 10 years, we built that company from 50 people to uh, about 2,000 people right now. We built it from $18 million of business to right now about $850 million. And we became the most used security product in the world. We're on 35% of all the world's computers. Um, you know, for people in the States who know something like Norton or McAfee, I usually tell them that we have more users in Brazil than, more, than Norton or McAfee have in the entire world. <laughs> um, 
We operate the world's largest cloud-based machine learning security engine in the world. It's, it's all bespoke. We run 11,000 servers, 60 million simultaneous connections, 450 million monthly active users, and we stop over 3 billion attacks a month. It's just a fantastic thing, and it's exciting for someone like me. And then we finally took the company public. Uh, we tried in 2012 in the US. The economy was bad here. We pulled it. We went public in May in London. Uh, we were the largest ever software uh, IPO um, in Europe and the largest tech IPO ever uh, in, um, in London. And uh, the company's gone, you know, gone well since it went public. But it's been a great ride, and it's really due to UC Irvine. And I think the school is really the best in the nation at promoting this upward mobility. So even now, I was looking it up the other day, you know, 38 years after I graduated, over half of UCI students are first generation college students. That is impressive. And that is so much that the school is giving back to society. So last night, I was just looking up for fun. What were the numbers for Harvard, Cal, Stanford, and UCLA? Uh, Harvard, Cal, and Stanford were between 14 and 17 percent. UCLA didn't seem to publish it, which means it's probably pretty low. Very embarrassing. They're not really giving back to society, helping those people that really need help. And, you know, because times have changed now. One or two generations ago, you can make a good middle class living with a trade as a blue collar worker, as my father did. You can't do it anymore. Even here in Irvine, in the, you know, from the 60s until the 80s, all these office parks around here were manufacturing. There were chips being made, there were computers, there were medical devices, components, aircraft suppliers, aircraft, automobiles. Uh, all of that is gone. And it's gone, you know, which means all the jobs associated with that, which were very good paying blue collar jobs, are gone. And as a nation, we still have a lot of problems with social and racial equality and, uh, and diversity, including gender diversity. And we never have this equality without that economic equality and access to education. And uh, education is really that key to upward mobility. And it makes me proud, really, that UCI continues to be, I think, a, a leader here. And you know, looking around campus, not so much here, but really with the undergraduate students, uh, especially in ICS, you know, one's really struck by the large percentage of Asian students. And that's great. Uh, but we also tend not to remember how difficult of a time you know, uh, they've actually had in California. You know, as I mentioned, my, uh, my wife is Chinese. My first girlfriend here, she was actually the grader in my math class. It didn't help me. <laughs> <laughs> she was Nisei Japanese, you know, first generation. You know, her father was uh, injured in the war fighting for the 442nd. At the same time, the best man, his father, the best man at my first marriage, uh, his father was locked up in Manzanar just for the crime of being Japanese. You know, for many years, Asian immigration was prohibited in the U.S. Even until around, I think, 1920, the educational system in San Francisco was segregated. And Asians were, you know, required to go to Asian-only schools if they could get to, into any school. Uh, so it, it's been a tough time. And as the father of, you know, children who have Chinese, you know, I get real embarrassed when I have to go over this with my kids as both an American and a native Californian. So, you know, I'm really proud of how UCI has played a real meaningful role in providing upward mobility. And it's not just on, on the Asian side. You look around campus and the statistics, we have a heavy Hispanic enrollment now and growing, and that is, uh, that is fantastic. You know, the, uh, uh, UCI is not perfect. Uh, there's still a lot of issues, but I think it's one of the universities doing the best in the U.S. We, in the industry, you know, companies are getting publicly beat up for the lack of female engineers, and rightfully so. But, you know, it's kind of stuck at around most companies 15, 16, 17 percent, which sounds really low. But when you look at the percentage of women who are graduating from computer science schools, it's 17 percent nationally. So what's, you know, what we're seeing in companies is basically the same as what's coming out of the university system. And what I was really surprised to find out about is that the percentage of women graduates peaked in 1984 at something like 36%. And it's been in just kind of a free fall ever since. Um, now, 
Most of my developers are in the Czech Republic. 17% sounds really bad. I was meeting with some of uh, the uh, recent um, um, college grads uh, a month or two ago, and I asked one of them, a woman, saying, you know, how many women were in your, your graduating class? I said, hey, were there 5%, 10%, 20%, 30%? And she laughed and said, not even one. <laughs> Um, so as bad as the uh, U.S. is, it is still you know, far ahead of other parts of the world. But, uh, you know, we've got to do better. UCI is doing better. I think UCI is, what, 25, 30 percent, something like that right now. So, you know, it, it is you know, so much better than normal. But, um, you know, there's no, there's no good reason why most of the software should be written by 20, you know, by 20 and 30-year-old white men. We need that diversity, not just the gender diversity, the racial diversity, the social economic diversity. All these people bring different ideas, different thoughts, different ways of doing things, um, you know, different ways of a, of a user interface to, uh, to, uh, to engage with people. So it, I think it's really important to continue to strive here. I think UCI is doing a good job. I'm sure they could do better. But I think you know, the fundamental issues are happening in, in the educational system far before uh, UCI. Um, so it's an exciting time to be in software, not just because of all the cool and neat technology. You know, we got big data, we got machine learning, we got this so-called cloud. I used to say cloud is just like you know an IBM 370 with T, you know, with TSO. Uh, <laughs> obviously, it's a bit more complex now. Um, uh, you know, we got uh, analytics, we got all of this stuff, and many of us get so focused on that. You know. We get focused on the technology and it excites us. We often think that technology is the end game, but it's not. It's just a tool. It's a very powerful tool. Um, and you know, I think as we look through history, and I heard, I heard a little bit of it on the last panel, societies have tended to be driven by, by builders. Uh, you know, Egypt, uh, you know, civil engineers obviously have monuments that still, still exist. Rome. You know, 2,000 years ago, had a you know 50,000 mile network of roads to connect you know basically all of their colonies. You know, the small nations, Spain, Portugal, England, even Venice, ruled large parts of the world because of their uh, navy and uh, and merchant fleets. And of course, machinery and steam power, uh, as we know, all enabled the machine age. But now it's really the age of data and the software engineer. And that's why I was saying that hey, you know, geeks rule these days. You know, we are the previous generation's, you know, uh, you know civil engineers, builders, you know, uh, military. Um, and they're the ones that are, that are driving change, even, so even social change. But we at times forget everything that we do has ramifications. You know, we look at that in the last presidential cycle. The news industry has been disrupted. You know, very few people get news from, say, real news sources. You know, some of the surveys I've seen for around the world most everyone gets the news from social media. The only thing social media wants to show you is things you agree with because you click on it so they can make some money. <laughs> uh, you know, people aren't getting access to alternative viewpoints. It's a bubble. Social media and search engines, you know, massive loss of privacy. I think most of us here realize that. Most normal users don't really. Um, and you know, what's the trade-off? You know, what are they getting in exchange for giving up all of their privacy? Uh, but there's really no going back on it. You know, uh, you know it, it is going to be the future. Internet commerce, we know it's severely hindered uh, retail. And uh, maybe that's the natural order of things. But for many years, remember, e-commerce in the US was subsidized because they had the loophole of not charging buyers the state sales tax. Because state sales tax was the obligation of the buyer, not the seller. So they could use the loophole, hey, yeah, yeah, the dean, you were required, if you bought it from California, you were required to send a check to California for the sales tax that was due. Of course, no one did it. So we had a very uneven playing field. Uh, the taxi industry, similarly, it's been devastated by, uh, by Uber. Medallions in New York City that used to cost uh, $1 million, we could argue there's something wrong with the taxi industry when a medallion costs a million, are now down to $100,000. And you can even run for president using primarily Twitter and win. But on the opposite side, you know, the technology uh, you know, and, so, uh, and, uh, you know, and, and social media have really enabled the spread of information in uh, totalitarian, uh, totalitarian countries. And coming from 
a country which, you know, uh, I don't know how, how familiar people are with the Czech Republic, but the Czech Republic, or before that, uh, Czechoslovakia, has been basically continuously occupied from the 1200s until the time between the two world wars and from 1989 until now. So this is a country that really values its independence, really values free thought, really values open access. And that is something that, you know, that the internet really brings. So I think, you know, and then many parts of the world, you know, the, uh, the, the, the internet has, you know, has been kind of that forcing function for so much social change. And of course, you know, speaking as uh, someone who runs a security company, all this global connectivity and all the data out there really drives, uh, you know, two big businesses, cybercrime and cybersecurity. And uh, we focus on the cybersecurity side of it. <laughs> um, we're all, you know, starting to see a lot of backlash, of course. You know, the amount of data Google has about everyone. Facebook losing what, 30, you know, private information on 30 million, 50 million people, you know, um, uh, banks being hacked, Target, the uh, uh, Home Depot, you can take your pick. And there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of backlash now, especially in Europe. Uh, GDPR, I don't know if you've heard of uh, GDPR, and uh, also European citizens' right to be forgotten on the internet. And the EU trying to impose its own laws on Google, et cetera, globally, not just for what's available in Europe. Um, so you know, I really think that the days of technology growing unbridled, you know, which we've had in the last, say, 10 or 15 years, it's been the wild, wild west uh, out there, um, I think they're reaching an end. Uh, it's not that you know, the, the progress of technology is going to end, but we're going to start seeing more scrutiny. We're going to start seeing more regulation. And that's not necessarily bad. It's a, it's a sign of a, um, of a mature, uh, of a mature uh, industry. Um, and, and, and it's also a reminder that what we are doing really has the ability to influence and change society. And there's a, you know, there's a quote we've all heard, and it's either attributed to Voltaire, which makes it seem like a really important quote, or to Spider-Man. <laughs> <laughs> and that is, of course, with great power comes great responsibility. And we have great power in this industry now. And we have to follow it up uh, with that responsibility. But it's an exciting time. We see what computers have become over the last 50 years. Maybe the mouse hasn't changed much, uh, but everything else really has. Look at how the ARPANET has grown in today's, uh, into today's web. And you know, the computing power in any of our phones is you know, many, many orders of magnitude greater than what was in that 1968 Apollo navigation computer. And it's exciting to think about how these technologies and how society uses them will change in the next 50 years. You know, we couldn't have imagined ARPANET growing to what it is now. So what is the web going to grow to in the next 50 years? Uh, I won't be around to see it. I suspect most people in here won't be around to see it. But just thinking about what my grandchildren will experience, if my kids ever have any. <laughs> um, it's good enough. Um, so thank you all for listening. Thank you uh, to, uh, to UCI for giving me this uh, little bit of a platform. And many, many thanks to UCI for the opportunities uh, that their education have opened up for me. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>